This is the second part of video six. We're going to talk about sources of radioactive isotopes and half-life, the concept of the rate of decay of radioisotopes. Now the type of decay matters, whether it's alpha, beta, or gamma, when it comes to biological effects. Alpha does the most damage to the tissue, but it has less penetrating power. So if the source is outside the body, you can normally protect yourself with protective clothing, but if the source is ingested, or inhaled inside the body, it can be very bad because um, tissue damage will occur. Beta it has intermediate penetrating power, um, but it, it can penetrate a few millimeters um, through skin, or a few millimeters, which could get it down into the skin. So if it's um, inside your body, it can do damage, and if it's outside your body as well. Um, and gamma radiation has got the greatest penetrating power, um, so much so that it can go right through your skin and your bones, and it could pass straight through you, or if targeted um, to a certain part of your body, um, it can uh, cause serious tissue damage to the point where it can, uh, it's used to actually kill um, cancer cells by destroying them. All right, so there's something about the penetrating power and whether or not the isotope that you're exposed to gives off alpha, beta, or gamma radiation. And the other um, factor that affects the um, biological effect is the rate of decay. Uh, how fast does the radioisotope um, undergo radioactive decay? Let me show you a little... This is a little um, animation showing uh, what we mean by half-life, or rate of radioactive decay. Here, the red dots show um, a large number of identical atomic nuclei that all obey the same decay law. Um, and so uh, let's just start this to show how this radio, radio uh, nuclei uh, undergo radioactive decay. I've started it, and you can see as the red dots disappear, it's indicating that those particular atoms have undergone radioactive decay. And this graph here is showing um, the rate of, re of decay. And as it turns out, all uh, isotopes, radioisotopes, follow the same rate law or pattern. That means, um, and it's called first order uh, rate kinetics, and it decays in this way. And because they all follow the same rate law, we can say that um, we can identify the half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of the radioisotopes to decay. So in this case, the half-life was 50 seconds. And so you could see uh, if you go about halfway down to 50 seconds, maybe right here. Um, let's see. Whoops, we're having some problems with this. But anyway, it would be about right here. You can see 50 seconds would be half. And then in another 50 seconds, half of that sample would decay. And in another 50 seconds, half of that original sample. So if we um, increase the half-life to 100 seconds, and restart the, um, the decay, you can see that the rate is slower. So the longer the half-life, that means it takes that much time for half of the original sample to disappear. So you can see that this is um, uh, decaying the same uh, rate law, but the time is longer for half of it to decay. So different radioisotopes have different what's called half-lives. They can be very, very um, short time spans or very, very long time spans, depending on the radioisotope. They all decay using the same rate law. It's just the time that the unit on the um, horizontal axis will be different. Okay, let's go back to our... So the half-life, by definition, is the the uh, time required for the level of radioactivity to fall to one half of its value. In the examples that we just saw, we saw a half-life of 50 seconds and a half-life of 100 seconds. Um, in both cases, the, the uh, graph looked like this, which is what we call first order uh, rate kinetics, but the time scale was different. And in this particular example of plutonium-239, the half-life is the amount of time it takes for, they're saying this is 100% of the original sample, the time it takes to fall to half the original amount um, right here, if you go down, is 24,000 years, 24,110 years. So that means if you start with, a, say, 100 atoms, in 24,110 years, you'll end up with 50 atoms. And then the next um, half-life would be another 24,110 years. That would get you up to 48,220 years before you have 
again, half remaining. So one half times one half is one fourth. And then half of that again would be one half times uh, uh, one fourth would be one eighth remaining, um, about 12.5%, all the way out at 72,000 years. So you can see that the curve looks the same, but the time scale is different. And the uh, rates are given in um, most widely expressed in terms of half lives. So half-life, the time required for the level of radioactivity to fall to one half of its value. And so here's just some different isotopes so you can get a feel for the, the wide variety of half-lives. So for example, uranium-238, the one that's found in the soil, the half-life is 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years. Okay, that's 4.5 billion years for half of the original sample to decay. Potassium-40, 1.3 times 10 to the ninth years. That's why we have um, radioactive potassium potassium isotopes still mixed in with, um, you know, a regular sample of potassium. Whereas um, polonium-214 has a half-life of only 0 0.000016 seconds, so that doesn't stay around for very long. So this is how we could explain, even though we have in nature um, radioactive isotopes, we know they're undergoing spontaneous radioactive decay. If that's the case, you may ask yourself, why do we have any of those isotopes remaining? The reason why is because the decay rate in some cases is very very slow okay and in some cases it's very very fast alright so let's practice that um, to, to predict how much uh, radioactivity would remain or how much time in this case tritium uh, tritium is sometimes formed in the primary coolant water of a nuclear reactor and it's a beta emitter with a half-life of 12.3 years so for a given sample containing tritium, after how many years will only, only about 12% about of the radioactivity remain? So given the, um, the, the uh, half-life, the question is, uh, how long will it take to only have 12% of the original value? So from here we know that one half-life, and the abbreviation is T1 half, that commonly um, T1 half is equal to half-life. So after one half-life, um, that means half of the sample remains. And in this case, that would be 50% uh, uh, of the sample would remaining. And then after two half-lives, two half-lives, um, only one-fourth is going to remain, and that would be 25% remaining of the original sample. After three half-lives, that would mean one-eighth, because it's one-half of one-fourth would remain, and that's about 12%. So it's 12.5, but they said about, so about 12%. So for estimating here, um, one half-life takes 12.3 years. So it would be 12.3 years plus 12.3 years plus 12.3 years, or 3 times 12.3 times 12.3 years equals about um, 36.9 which is about 40 years. So I would say, to answer this question, after about 40 years, 12% of the radioactivity would remain. So this starts giving you a clue as to why um, uh, nuclear waste from power plants is a problem, because you create all of these uh, radioactive isotopes. It takes varying amounts of time to, um, to, to, for those isotopes to no longer be radioactive. Okay, so let me here in closing give a couple of examples of some um, problems with some particular radioisotopes. First of all, iodine-131. Iodine-131 itself is a beta emitter. It has a half-life of eight days. And the problem with um, iodine-131 is that it is a fission product. Um, so it's going to, it, it, it is a product of of nuclear fission reactions. So it's found in a nuclear uh, fuel cells and then the waste nuclear fuel cells that are still stored on site. Um, it itself is water soluble and iodine is um, a micronutrient that is needed for hormones in your thyroid gland. And so it collects iodine in your body. Once it's in your body, it collects in the thyroid gland. So the problem is that if uh, iodine-131 accidentally gets into the um, environment, say from a nuclear power plant, it will, it will dissolve in water, so it can get in the groundwater, and then it can be, um, if you happen to drink the water or you eat something else that has drank the water and now has that uh, iodine in it, 
then you could uh, be exposed to this uh, iodine-131 and it will collect in your thyroid gland. Um, so um, in, in small amounts, uh, small amounts of iodine-131 can actually lead to thyroid cancer, whereas high concentrations of iodine-131 uh, uh, are actually used for medicinal uses to treat thyroid cancer, to treat thyroid cancer. Okay, see in the high doses, um, it, because it's a beta emitter, it will just uh, kill the tissue around it and it, it will be just right in the thyroid. It doesn't penetrate very far and since it's in the thyroid, it kills the thyroid tissue. It's actually a great uh, treatment for uh, thyroid cancer. But in small doses, it just does enough damage then uh, to the thyroid cells that could then lead to mutant cells, which then leads to cancer. And so people who have been exposed to iodine-131, for example, from nuclear accidents, for example, Chernobyl, have been shown to have a greater incidence of thyroid cancer. So it's a good and a bad thing. Um, and then radon-222, I promise I'd come back to that one. Radon-222 is an alpha emitter, and um, it has a half-life of only four days. Um, it's a noble gas, so what happens with radon-222, since it is a decay product of uranium-238, um, and uranium-238 has a half-life of uh, 4.6 billion years, um, all the uranium is, is a very slow um, you know, uh, uh, decay process. So that's why we still, um, even though the Earth is, is so old, we still have uranium-238 around, which is constantly undergoing this uh, very slow radioactive process. Well, the, the problem is, is if a radon-222 happens to um, be produced and then seep out, once it's a gas, it can seep out of the ground. Um, and then if you happen to be uh, breathe in to your lungs, uranium-222, and it undergoes uh, radioactive decay, you can be bombarded inside your lungs with an alpha particle, which is going to do damage. Now, if it's not very much, it shouldn't be too big of a problem, but if you have a high concentration of it, it is a problem. And the other problem is, once the radon-222 undergoes radioactive decay, you know, it keeps decaying um, down, down, down to polonium. Eventually, it can get to polonium-210, uh, which is a solid. So all the other decay products um, after uh, radon-222 are solid, so then that particular radioisotope is going to be stuck in your lungs, and it's going to continue to undergo radioactive decay. Polonium uh, is an alpha emitter um, as well, and it um, has a half-life of about 140 days, okay? And so then it will further decay, further decay um, to other um, radioisotopes, which can then continue um, one radon-222 can give one alpha emission, but then the decay products further down the line can continue to emit both beta and alpha, uh, depending on what it is. So that's why it's a problem if it gets into your lungs and it undergoes decay before you have a chance to breathe it out of your lungs. Okay, and so it's found, um, uh, you know, obviously uh, from the U-38, which is in the crust of the earth. And so what has happened, people have found, is the radon-222 can collect in basements. Um, and the decay product, like I said, is a solid. So a lot of times people will have radon detectors in their homes if they have a basement. And if they have uh, high levels of radon, then they just have to install ventilation systems to keep circulating the air in, in their basements to make sure that the radon-222 passes right out of the basement. So anyway, that's just two examples of two radioisotopes, iodine-131 and radon-222, um, that can cause problems. And I think you can start seeing that nuclear waste um, can be a problem because uh, nuclear fuel pellets have uh, a large amount of uranium-238 and also a fission product is iodine-131. So those are just two examples of some of the problems um, with the um, leftover uh, fuel from spent uh, nuclear uh, fuel cells. So we'll talk more about that in the next video.